The quarters, halves, and wholes are the least time-consuming way to sell beef. So I always say to people who are looking to get started in it, if they don't have a ton of time, that's a great aspect um, just to add in, and it doesn't require too much more, so much more labor. Um, the beef bundles and individual cuts and wholesale accounts, act, they absolutely add a lot of time commitment and like infrastructure too so you have to have like larger freezer storage and inventory system and a lot of other like logistical um, items when you're selling that way but we saw that the consumers were the the large bulk buys of beef is not for everyone so one issue is freezer space so not everyone has Hey, hey, I'm Shay, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new ideas and management practices to improve their lifestyle and operation. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you know that I am now open for speaking gigs. So if you want me to lead a workshop, be on a panel, or deliver a keynote at your next event, you can connect with me on my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and just use the contact box and I'll get back to you. So with that, let's dive right in to today's episode. Hey folks, I want to take a quick second to talk about a company that's doing some pretty cool things because we all know as cattle producers that funding and finances can be a little stressful, but harvest returns makes things simpler. Cattle ranching is hard work, but finding funding to start or grow your operation doesn't have to be. While traditional bank loans still have a place in finance, some ranchers have transitioned to an alternative form of funding through passive investors. Harvest Returns has raised over $12 million for multiple cattle ranchers across across the United States. Harvest Returns works with each ranch individually to help develop flexible terms that best suit the business's plan and cash flows. The company's pool of nearly 13,000 investors can help you expand your herd, fund improvements to your ranch, or help you scale to access new channels. Harvest Returns offers both debt or equity options and works within your existing operating model. To learn more about the capital raise process with Harvest Returns, visit harvestreturns.com cc and I'll put that link in the show notes. All right, Hannah. Well, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Um, you've been on the list for a while and I know you've talked to my Rancher Mind group before about your business selling beef directly to consumers, but I uh, do think it'll be great to have you on the show to talk to the whole audience of listeners a little bit about what you do and kind of cover this segment of the beef industry. So to get started, can you just tell everyone who's listening a little bit about where you're located and what your business is as far as selling beef. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been, I think, I don't know how long we've known each other now. I'd guess four, four or five years, I think. Probably because so. it was my first year of college. <laughs> yeah. So I gotten to see like the whole process and you develop um, this whole endeavor and it's been really cool to see that too so um, kudos to you but I'm excited to be on so just to give a little insight into Oak Barn Beef so we will celebrate our fifth year anniversary next month which is exciting Um, we started selling our beef direct to consumer just as a way to put a face to the farmer like a lot of um, ranchers start selling that way because of that and since then we have been selling online predominantly and just this year in January of 2023 we um, opened our retail storefront in West Point Nebraska so that's been an interesting addition to the business of selling online and e-commerce and then shipping nationwide to actually welcoming customers into our storefront and learning the retail side of things too. Yeah, well, I've also been able to watch you grow your business. And so when you started, were you selling quarters, halves and holes first or did you start by selling like individual cuts and bundles? How did you start marketing? These? Yeah. So my dad um, had been selling like holes, halves and quarters, like a lot of the ranchers do just to like neighbors and friends and family and that sort. So he had kind of tapped into that area. And then when I wanted to start getting involved into selling beef, um, we created bundles down to like one sixteenth of a beef uh, and started selling those locally in the Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska areas. 
Um, and then later on, probably, I want to say it was like four or five months later after Oak Barn Beef started is when we pivoted to selling individual cuts, um, beef bundles, so like variety packs, and then our subscription boxes. Um, but we also do sell like the beef shares, so quarters, halves, and wholes too. So do you do any marketing to restaurants too? Yes. Yeah. So we supply mostly ground beef to restaurants. So one is a take and bake kitchen here in West Point, and then um, a LinkedIn uh, cafeteria center in Omaha too. So they use both of those ones use our ground beef. And then we just started selling some New York strips to a local restaurant here in West Point called the Bohemian Duck. So um, dabbled in the wholesale space. <laughs> Those, uh, we also sell like beef jerky and sticks and summer sausage wholesale to some convenience stores in Nebraska. Well, you have a lot going on and have made a lot of different changes to how you sell beef. I would say it's fairly common when I talk to producers that a lot of them are selling quarters, halves, and wholes already. I know my family does that. I know a lot of other people who do, but what kind of were those drivers that made you change how you were marketing beef and what you were offering because you went from quarters, halves, and holes to beef bundles and individual cuts, and then you have the restaurant aspect. What kind of drove you to make those changes and additions? Yeah, um, the quarters, halves, and holes are the least time-consuming way to sell beef. So I always say to people who are looking to get started in it, if they don't have a ton of time, that's a great aspect um, just to add in, and it doesn't require too much more, so much more labor. Um, the beef bundles and individual cuts and wholesale accounts, act, they absolutely add a lot of time commitment and like infrastructure too. So you have to have like larger freezer storage and inventory system and a lot of other like logistical um, items when you're selling that way. But we saw that the consumers were the, the large bulk buys of beef is not for everyone. So one issue is freezer space. So not everyone has the deep freeze out in their garage full of beef. Like I grew up with, at least I'm sure you did too, Shay. Yep. Maybe um, a couple. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of them just have like their upright fridge in the freezer compartment that's already stuffed full of other foods. So it's difficult for them to um, store it. But then the other thing is being able to pay that large amount of money at one time. You hear that from like a lot of people who have bought like holes, halves and quarters. If they're not used to that, that seems like a lot of investment up front. Um, so the individual cuts, I'd say the beef bundles are more like filling that need for the people who want the to buy direct from the farm but don't have the freezer space. But the individual cuts is more so like an experience. So those are people who are sending it as gifts or um, or like ordering it for their dinner party that they're having um, next week or something along those lines. Um, and then like the subscription box aspect, that's that's the freezer storage space too. Those people want the quality beef, but they don't have the freezer space typically or the means to put up all that money up front. Um, and then I guess the wholesale aspect, we added that in um, just, we had a few years under our belt before we added that in and it seemed very daunting at first, but the ground beef, you 50% of what you get back on a carcass is about is ground beef. So it's, you have a huge surplus of that to sell versus the ribeyes that you get back. Eric, my husband always jokes that if you could like genetically engineer a steer, that would be all ribeyes. You would be so rich because that's the main cut people want. Um, but to manage that inventory of ground beef, that's where we've really like seen the wholesale accounts come in handy. Uh, just to move more of that, but it's at a lower cost too. So we have to make sure we're making enough on our other steaks and, and higher quality cuts to cover that selling it at a lower cost wholesale. Well, thank you for diving into that. And that does all make sense. Now, I have not had a chance to really talk to you since you've opened your storefront. So, you know, what, why did you decide to do that? Because going from, you know, some businesses started with storefronts and have gone more to online, especially after COVID. And you've kind of done the opposite where you started a lot online and now you have a storefront. So why did you decide to open that and how has that gone for you? 
Yeah, um, I think the opportunity just presented itself and that's kind of how it worked out. But we are looking for a larger um, like freezer and distribution space. So since we ship, we have to have a lot of room for like just shipping supplies. So boxes, the insulator coolers that go in it, and then it, they just take a lot of room. So before we purchased the building in town, we were at, um, we were using like a retired hog barn out on the farm that used to be a farrowing barn. Um, and we had beef room is what we called it, but all, we were just outgrowing that space. So we started looking for more and a building came up for sale in West Point that was um, used car sales out of an office portion and then an auto mechanic shop in the big like warehouse portion. So we converted that into our area where our freezer is um, and then like a large storage area where we ship out of too. And then where the office was, I just need a small office where it's basically me and Eric who work out of here. So uh, we didn't need the whole office space. So the retail front of, of the building just really worked out in that way. And we had been hearing from a lot of local customers who wanted to come um, and shop our meats in person. And then the other aspect of that is that our a lot of our clients would drive like from Lincoln or Omaha, which is over an hour to come pick up beef. And so it's a nice place to welcome them in versus into like an old dark hog barn. <laughs> so <laughs> I figured even if the local like sales weren't a huge part of our business, at least we're still serving like our current clientele too. Um, so we've been open now for just a few months and it was now typically in March is when retail sales like slow down overall. Um, so this month has been a little slower, but I can see that like picking back up again once uh, like the spring weather starts happening, everyone kind of comes out of their their hole once the weather turns nicer and it's grilling weather too. So, but the first few months we were like matching our online sales, which was mind blowing to me. I would have never expected that. So it's been better than we expected. Well, good for you. And I think we're all ready for grilling season. <laughs> yeah. I would say so. <laughs> So I want to talk about some of the challenges you face because you've, you're a great example of success, a great success story. You and Eric are a great team, but I know that hasn't come without its challenges. So what have been some of those main challenges that come with selling beef directly to consumers? Yeah. Um, the first few that come to mind when we first started one huge learning curve was the butcher side of the business. Uh, just because I had more experience with like live cattle side and then um, like I was learning how to market during that too. But the butcher just seemed like a unknown category for me. So I'd say that's like a lot of people, they have a a learning curve there when they first start. Um, We've gotten over that a little bit in the the past few years and put some more processes into place and expanded knowledge in that. And now I'd say our biggest um, like two issues is one is like the ground beef surplus. So that's something that I think a lot of people who sell direct to consumer and sell single cuts uh, do face. And and it's just trying to manage like all inventory. So like um, the amount of roast when we're going into the summertime, um, the, and then ground beef and things like that too. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, The other one I would say is like, since commodity prices have been so high, it does make our margins a lot more thin because we're buying cattle typically at weaning time um, and then feeding like a corn ration. And so all of the, those prices have been higher. So um, that's, it depends a lot on commodity markets still. I know a lot of people are sell direct to consumers, so they're not as, um, as affected by the commodity markets and variability there, but it, it does affect us too. So when did you turn to other people who are, who were selling direct to consumer to get through some of those challenge, or was it something where you just really focused on the relationships you were trying to build with all segments of your business? You know, what advice do you have for overcoming some of those challenges? Yeah. Um, first off, when I was, when I first started Oak Barn Beef, I had the opportunity to intern at one of like the largest direct-to-consumer meat companies in the United States. So they didn't offer a 
uh, formal internship program, but I mailed these random people that I saw on Instagram a letter off of it that lived in California and asked if I could live with them for the summer and intern with them. Um, so I moved to Five Mary's Farms out in California, and they taught me a lot about shipping a perishable product, um, like the butcher side of things. I got to talk through a lot of those roadblocks with them, and that was very helpful too, especially when we were starting. So, and then I took that knowledge and kind of transitioned it to what what we are today, and and did make some changes and stuff to what I was taught. But I think that's all entrepreneurship too. Um, as far as like the butcher relationships go and things I think it is just just getting a better relationship with them so it's being in there to ask their questions and really ask like how can we work best with you um the last thing we want is to be a pain in the butt for our butchers so that they are we we want them to enjoy us as customers as much as they want us to enjoy them um and so I think just going into it with like okay how are we going to put processes into place so that we can make this work the best is a mindset that we've taken through with a lot of like our vendors or like partners that we work with. Um, overall to direct to consumer companies, I would say there's a lot more resources out now of people who have been doing this for a while. So that really helps um, to seek out some of those resources too and, and talk to other people who are going through the same things. Well, awesome. So I know you are, from hearing you talk before, I know you're big on relationship building and you put a lot of value on how that has helped your business. So when we look at the relationships you've built with your customers, why are people choosing to buy directly from you as opposed to going to the grocery store? Um, so, or, you know, buying from one of those other avenues. So why are they choosing to buy directly from the rancher? Yeah, that's a great question. I I think the biggest thing in this business is marketing. Like, how are we going to reach our customers and how are we going to serve them? Um, so one thing I've been very intentional about is learning how to storytell better. So I'm still in the process of this. I wouldn't say I'm the best storyteller, but it's it's thinking through how can we invite people into our lives in this process and show them not only who they're buying their beef from, but like education in a certain aspect. So like one thing we do is Fridays on the farm and it's once a month and we just share about what's going on on our farm and like area farms during that time of year. And so that's just one like simpler way than um, to invite them into that story and kind of tell our point of view or like we don't harvest a lot of row crops or anything. So during that time of year, I, I really like lean on some of the other producers in the area to kind of share about what they're doing. Um, but to go back to the initial question, I think that the biggest thing is like they know who they're buying from. And so we try to tell that story initially. And so that's what usually gets customers to make the first purchase is because they want to support us as their ranchers, which is always a uh, such a um, like compliment to us too. We take that very seriously. Um, but the quality of our beef is what keeps customers coming back. So that's a huge part of just selling direct to consumers. You need to have a great product too. Uh, so we do that. We ensure that product like in two ways. Um, one is we do DNA testing on all of our, on all of our cattle. Um, so we test them with through Neogen with the um, beef profile test and look at their carcass traits. So we only purchase the ones that fit into our program um, that meet our criteria. And then that way they're higher quality from the beginning. So we're a big believer in that, those genetics. Um, and then we do finish them out here in West Point at my in-laws farm, actually. So they're finished on corn, corn ration. Um, and then the butcher does do like an extended hang on the carcass too. So it's dry aged beef as well. And so I think those two, two or three things there that I said um, really help like ensure that we are selling a, a good quality product too. And I hear it from customers all the time that they haven't had like beef like that since they were living on the farm and like their grandpa just got like a, a, a beef butchered at the local butcher and stuff. And so I think it's fun to like hear them reminiscing on those times as well. Well, that that's amazing. And connecting with the consumer is always very important. 
Hey folks, I want to take a brief break to talk about one of my favorite calving books. And you know, if you're tired of the hassle of managing your cattle records, I want to introduce you to Cattle ID because it will do the work for you. The Cattle ID platform makes it easy to store, share, and collaborate on all your herd information from your mobile device. It saves you a lot of time and effort. Plus, you get access to actionable analytics that can help you and your team make better decisions for your ranch. Don't just take my word for it. Try Cattle ID and feel the magic of hassle-free ranch management for yourself. Seriously, sign up now and see the difference it can make for you and your team. There's a link in the show notes. So, I know you were kind of ahead of that trend. And when I say trend, I'm thinking about, you know, that COVID time period where a lot of more, a lot more people started, it seemed like they started selling direct to consumer. Maybe they were just advertising it more. You know, do you think this increase in people selling direct to consumer will continue to grow? What are your kind of thoughts on it as it fits into the beef industry? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, a lot of businesses started up during the pandemic. Um, and since we were a little more established at that point, I think we would have been uh, two, two or three years under our belt at that point. That did help too, since we were already shipping and already marketing. Um, so we gained a lot of customers through that process too, or time, I should say, not process. Um, it was a process. <laughs> yeah, it felt like a process. <laughs> um, I I do see a lot more people moving in that direction of selling like direct to consumer. And I can see that like continuing because I just think that consumers overall are wanting to get back to where their food is coming from and learn, which is exactly what we want as beef producers for them to like come ask the farmers and ranchers and and like take that in their own hand, not just like fear-based marketing. Um so I, I do see that trend like continuing. Um, the, the biggest threat that I see to this though is like a food born illness outbreak from somebody buying farm to table. So I, that is something I worry about. And so as long as everyone who is selling beef direct to consumer like takes that cut that risk or they manage that risk and, and handle the food properly and things throughout that process and follow all the laws and stuff that are in place for, for that reason. I think that's the, the trend will continue. So what do you do to make sure that you're being responsible when it comes to food safety and ensuring that that consumer has a good experience? Yeah. One, one thing is we use a USDA inspected butcher, which I know is not as easily accessible for everyone. So there are like state inspected programs and custom exempt lockers to a lot of people use. Our butcher is now only like seven miles away from the farm. So we are very fortunate for that reason. And they do a good job too. Um, but, but that's where it all starts is the butcher. So you want to make sure that you're using a clean, um, facility and, and somebody you trust on that front. Um, the other thing is just like storage of the beef. If you are bringing it home, you should always have a thermometer in your freezer, like transporting the beef. Sometime if you're hauling it a long way, that's sometimes like logistically difficult, but just making sure that you are keeping it cold and frozen. And then our other part is our shipping process. So um, ensuring that our beef either stays frozen in transit or if it is starting to thaw that it's under like a certain amount of temperature and stuff. And we convey that to our customers. So um, I think that's part of it. And then the last part is the customer like cooking the beef. Um, so we do as much as we can on that front, but that's always, uh, people don't want to listen to that part of it all the time. So if we can do everything right while the beef is in our hands, that's kind of my mentality with it too. So I know I've heard of some people who sell, okay, one second there's, can you hear the truck in the background? No, I, it might be my end. No, no, no. It's my end. I live by the interstate. I live right by an overpass and the Jake breaks go off. So okay. I'm, I can, I'm just never sure if they like pick up or not. So no, our, our, I like live right by the, or this office is right by the highway and it's always, so you can always hear trucks in here too. So, okay. No. Okay. So 
I want to ask you a question about your shipping process. So I've heard of other people who sell direct to consumer. They track their shipments to make sure they get to their location within a certain day. And if they get lost, they'll tell like FedEx not to deliver it and return it because it was a perishable product. Is that something you do or how do you handle that? Because sometimes the mail system isn't always the most reliable. (laughs) Yeah, it's a huge headache in like UPS does not insure perishable shipments either. So if that product starts to thaw or that package is lost, we have not been able to get any money back from it. And I, there may be some other ways, workarounds this way, um, but we haven't found like a good solid way. So that that part of it just sucks, honestly. Um, as far as that goes, all of the tracking information is shared with the recipients. So when they place an order, all of that, it goes automatically to their inbox. Uh, and then like updates of the box too. So your package is out for delivery or things like that. Um, so I, it's, it's our customer's responsibility to track them just because I can't track that many packages easily. Mm-hmm. Um, however, if the package, I don't advertise this just because I don't want too many people to take advantage of this, like in a negative way. But if if a package is thawed during transit, we either offer a full re- refund or we encourage them to let us reship them a new one. And that's because one, we have enough inventory to do that. But two, we still have an opportunity to give them a good experience. So if we are able to reship a package and it arrives on time and frozen, then that potentially they are going to turn into like a reoccurring customer versus if we just give them a refund, they're never going to buy again from us. Um, So that's kind of our policy. And then if the beef is starting to thaw, we have them test it with a thermometer um, just to to let us know like that, the temperature of it too, because it can be under a certain threshold and still be okay to refreeze. Mm -hmm. But ideally all of it is delivered frozen. So you mentioned that you know, it takes a lot of work, especially once you start sending out bundles, individual retail cuts, all of that, and that it's mostly you and Eric who do a majority of the work. Um, how many, can you share like how many head you're shipping out a week or packages or like just to give people listening an idea of like the size of your business, just so they can kind of, because as you know, like it depends on where people are at with their business when they're listening to podcasts, if they're taking advice and whatnot. Yeah. Um, we butcher about a hundred head a year now. Um, so that's been like, we've definitely grown to this point. So we started doing, I believe our first year we did about 15. So from 2018 to 2021, we doubled in size every year too. Um, and then last year was the first full year that we've kind of been able to get our feet under us and get more processes into place. And we didn't want to double either because that would be a, I I can't even imagine doubling at that point. So, um, so I, I say that, but then I also want to like put that disclaimer on it. Like we didn't start with a hundred head a year. So somebody starting selling five, that's fantastic. That's the way to learn. It's just starting small and, and growing it from there too. Well, awesome. Thank you for being transparent and sharing that information. I know it always helps to when people can get an idea of the size of a business. So as we kind of wrap up, what if someone out there listening wants to get into selling beef direct to consumer, what questions do they need to ask themselves to make sure it's a feasible opportunity for them? Yeah. Um, the first thing that I always say is like marketing. Marketing is like the main thing that I do in this business. And that's because you have to reach your customers. So this is if you're looking to expand outside of your local like network and family, friends, neighbors kind of thing, because you have to find a way to reach those other people. So if you are looking to like grow in an online business or even local, you have to be able to market that product. Um, so I, I always give that as like a disclaimer first, because that is, it's a completely different world. And Shay, you know, this too, it's, Mm -hmm. you learn a lot of it as you go. And at first it seems extremely daunting and you just keep adding in as much as you can handle as you go. Um, the other thing, if you are looking to sell like individual cuts or some of the beef bundles, I would just think through some of the logistics for, like freezer space and in some of that things to start too, because it can add in a lot of logistics that you 
might not want to deal with or can deal with on your farm and your current workload. So Hannah, before we wrap up, where can people go to find more information about your business? Yeah, so the best way is our website is oakbarnbeef.com. And I actually just recently launched an online course for people who are wanting to sell um, direct to consumer and farm to table. So if you are interested in that, feel free to like contact me via our website or social media platforms. We're really active on Facebook as well. Um, and we'd love, love to chat with you more. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.